Way, how we doing? Welcome to the Pursue One podcast, your home for learning to pursue what matters most. Do me a favor, wherever you're listening to this podcast, hit the subscribe button. Also, I'd encourage you to leave us a comment. That helps us make this podcast better for you. And so leave us a comment below. I'd also encourage you to check out our social media. Uh, you can find us at Pursue One Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram. There, we're updating our content every day, uh, sharing with you on our story about all the things that we're doing. And if you've been following us on social media, you knew that uh, a few of our teammates just got back from a hunt in Alaska. They were bow hunting caribou on the Hall Road in Alaska. And so what we're going to do on this podcast is we're going to reflect upon that hunt and that experience. Driving down the road, headed to a fishing trip, we just threw the mics mics on and reflected upon that experience. One of the really cool things that I appreciate about this podcast is they talk about how it's possible for you and I to take the steps needed to get out there and bow hunt caribou or bow hunt really any species in Alaska. And so uh, I really encourage you to listen to the entirety of this podcast uh, take those hints to heart, and you can actually make the steps and do the things that need, are needed to get out there and bow hunt in Alaska, which, man, it would be incredible. So make sure you listen to the podcast. I'm also really excited here at Pursue One Outdoors to announce that we have our very first sponsor. Uh, our friends over at Wildside Beard Company have come on the sponsorship team, and uh, they are getting ready to launch a product nationwide called the Bow Hunter. And I'm really excited about this. If you know me, you also know that I don't have a beard. And that's completely okay because Wildside uh, has uh, multiple products for guys who don't have facial hair. But they're getting ready to launch this uh, product September 1st called the Bow Hunter. And uh, they've got tons of stuff for your beard. And they've got one product they are not announcing quite yet, but it's coming. Uh, But the product I'm really excited about is their CoverScent Soap. Uh, I'm going to take it with me and use it on my elk hunt here in Wyoming in the next few weeks. And so make sure you head over to their social media, hit the like button. Also, head over to their website, wildsidebeard.com. There you can learn all about their their cover scent products. You can learn all about their beard products, all about their soaps, and all the stuff that they hand make. And so this is a really good uh, product for you. They've also given us a promo code. Uh, use the promo code PURSUE1 and, uh, at checkout. It's the number one. And uh, you'll get a discount on your, your order. And so uh, make sure you head over to uh, wildsidebeard.com and check out all of the products that they have. Uh, but let's get to the podcast. Well, welcome to the Pursue One Outdoors podcast. This one's kind of special coming to you from Alaska. We are on our way down, actually driving in the car, uh, on our way from Wasilla to Seward, and we're going to go out on a, a halibut charter tomorrow, catch some some halibut to bring back to, um, to our house. So anyway, we're excited about that. We've been having a, a great time in Alaska. We have seen Alaska from top to bottom, and I'm uh, enjoying this trip with my son, Travis Michael. Travis is here with us. How's it going? And uh, we've just enjoyed that experience together as, as uh, father and son. And I've got David Nickel, who's Travis's friend from uh, their military acquaintance. So maybe you ought to explain how that all came about, guys. Well, uh, I'm David Nickel. I live here in Wasilla, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to host these fine fellows. We've had a good uh, four or five days up on the Hall Road hunting. But uh, I met Travis about three and a half, four years ago. Uh, He worked for me for about a year. But uh, I immediately took a liking to him and kind of felt like a father away from home to him. We hunted together a few times. Ran some races together, half marathon together. But uh, Travis called in a turkey for you, right? He sure did. He called in a turkey. First turkey I ever killed. We weren't in the woods, but about 10, 15 minutes. And, uh, man, he was, he was on the trail and in sight and game over. Well, we had him roosted. It was too easy. Yeah, we had him roosted, so we knew where he was. We came in probably 120 yards from his tree, Yeah. sat down talked to him a little bit before fly down 
And then he flew down, and I yelped at him a few times. He wasn't super interested. He turned and started walking away, and I cackled at him. And he about turned and ran your decoy over at that point. Yep. See, that's his, this good training of turkey calling that you had growing up from, from your dad. So. Yep. Travis is in the Air Force. Uh, well, that's really where he was working for you in the Air Force. But you're retired. Retired. Air Force. I am, yes. Uh, you had a pretty good rank. I, I noticed on your license plate it says Ammo E9. And so you spent 30 years serving our country. I did. We're grateful for that. Enjoyed every minute of it. And, uh, now I'm a civilian working for the Air Force again. Been doing the civilian job for about 14 years now. And that's what brought me to Alaska from North Carolina. But uh, we've been here about three years, and, man, we've just thoroughly enjoyed the hunting and fishing. Well, you have so many opportunities here. We were driving... So to, to set the scene for this Hall Run Road hunt, Travis and I both flew into Anchorage, and you live in Wasilla, a little bit north, home of Sarah Palin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if you ride the Alaskan Railroad, you'll actually go by your house. That's right. We saw it go by today. So next time you, anybody out there, if you're riding the Alaskan Railroad, you go through Wasilla, you need to look to the west and wave. Um, Dave might be out in his yard. Uh, mowing the shooting, grass. Mowing the grass or shooting some shooting arrows in the That's backyard, right? right? <laughs> so we did the haul road. We flew into Anchorage, um, and we just went north. We've seen Alaska now from the, not really the bottom, but I would say the bottom two-thirds yeah, all the probably. way to the top because yeah. we went to Dead Horse. Uh, Dead Horse was, well, we put 2,000 miles on the on the truck this week. And Dead Horse is about an 850 mile or so drive. As far north as you can drive in the 48 yep. or in the continental yeah. United States. And if, if you have not, if you've not experienced tundra, okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit. What the tundra is like in our impressions, and do our best to describe to you what it's like to, to walk across the tundra. And if you've not experienced the Hall Road, you've probably been on a country road somewhere. Some farmers maintenance road, some logging road that's been abandoned for a while. That is what is called the Dalton Highway in Alaska. 410 miles of dirt and gravel. And Beating potholes. you to death. <laughs> <laughs> the most ridiculous waste of government funds I think I've ever noted is a sign we saw, an electrified sign 350 miles, 400 miles, something like that into our pothole journey that warned us of potholes. <laughs> Warning, what, potholes. What a waste. I mean, the entire road. Folks, I can't describe to you. The, I mean, just incredible. There's nothing like it. I mean, There's it, nothing like it. You have to experience it to understand it. It's so vast, it never ends. And you're perpetually in mountains and valleys and crossing rivers and uh, just Alaska is beautiful. And... Um, yeah, like Travis said, it's vast. It's so enormous. And and people have been, you know, in the lower 48, you've maybe been to Colorado or Wyoming or Montana, places that are big and have big country. You live in Denver, right? I, so you've I been live, all over Colorado. Yeah, I live just outside of Denver. I hunt elk in the Rockies all the time. But Alaska just has a different feel to it. It's just so immense. So vast. Huge. Yeah, we, we, on the journey, just the journey, we saw, we had a moose come across. Uh, it was porcupines. Several roadkill and live. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else did moose. we see? We saw sheep. Sheep. Yeah, musk ox. Wolf. Yep. Several musk ox. A, a wolf. wolf. Yeah. And a wolf standing could, in Could have shot it and passed it up because we didn't know what the regulations were on it. Well, which sounds odd to, to you hunters that you wouldn't know what the regulation are, the seasons, because we're aware of those things. I live in Illinois in the Midwest. I, I pretty much know what's in season, out of season for all things. But up here, every zone is, is different. Different, yes. Different I, opening and closing of the season, different uh, quantities of animals that you can kill. The zones are almost like states in the lower 48. Yeah. They really are because 
for me, I could take off from my house and drive 850 miles and go south, and I'm in Florida. So I've crossed all those different zones, those different states, and Alaska is just one after another like that. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Did you mention mus- musk ox? Yep. Yeah. I don't, on one day we saw nine musk ox, and we're pretty close to a, a family of them. Pretty, pretty odd animal. I offered the chief $500 if he'd go smack one on the butt, but he didn't do it. Probably a wise decision. <laughs> they look like they're sleeping, standing there on their feet, pretty docile. But I, I've got a feeling, since they're able to defend themselves against grizzly bears. And wolves. Uh, that well, they're pretty tough. They're pretty tough, and yeah. they're able to survive. In fact, Travis, tell us about uh, this study you saw where they, they tested yeah, Highland tolerance. Scottish cow. Uh, American bison and a musk ox put them in a crate container that they had modified for the study to get colder and they monitored the metabolic rate of each animal to see at what temperature their metabolic rate went up which means their body has to adjust to the cold the highland cow was something around 20 degrees or, or something around there the bison was negative 20 and the musk ox, the crate hit negative 60, and it, they couldn't make it any colder, and it hadn't been affected yet. Wow. That's crazy. Well, if you see them, you can understand, because they oh, are absolutely. one hairy critter. We, we were assessing as we looked at this musk ox just where you would put your point of aim. Uh, and Dave, you said it was kind of like a grizzly bear. They're very deceptive because yeah. of the... Uh, the fur underneath it looks like they're much lower. You actually got to aim more in the middle than you would think. Yeah. You, um, why well, well, I mentioned grizzly bear, it made me think today I was looking at his grizzly bear uh, bait barrel. Uh, actually, it wouldn't be just grizzlies, I guess, but that's primarily your target, target with your bait yeah. barrel. Describe to us, because this thing's just ridiculous. There's teeth marks. There's this bear has pinched this plastic barrel with its teeth enough to, uh, to to cause a crease in it and puncture holes through the thing. Well, I beat on it with a hammer. I poked at it with a screwdriver. could even make a mark. Well, you actually stood on it, too, laid it on the side and stood <laughs> on the side and, and couldn't even dent it, I mean, or compress it any. But uh, it's probably, what, an eighth, quarter-inch thick poly- it, it, yeah. polyethylene uh, plastic. 55-gallon uh, so barrel. I mean, very sturdy barrel. But they have just almost demolished it with their... What do you put in that? How do you do that? That's something totally foreign to me in Illinois. Well, you, you take a 55-gallon barrel, and about the quarter way down, you drill or cut a hole about, oh, eight inches in diameter... And then uh, through the top, you put dog food. And I normally fill it up just to the bottom of that hole that I've cut. And you uh, want the hole small enough to where the bear can't get their head in, but they can get their hand in and rake out small handfuls of whatever bait you're using, whether it be dog food or bread or or some people even use popcorn, but that's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot easier carrying it up to the, to the bear bait barrel if you're on the side of a mountain or a hill somewhere, but it's a lot of work. And anyway, the, that way it lasts a little bit longer. You don't have to continually fill your barrel. But uh, this barrel that Jeff is referring to, they have actually bit into the side of it and somehow compressed it enough to make big cl- or bite marks. I'm just... You'd almost have to see it to believe it. Well, we actually have posted pictures on Pursue One. Uh, you can see from his trail cam this bear just pulverizing this barrel. I, well, one of your pictures actually, he even has it picked up in the air. He's got his arm in it, and another. He's and it's a it's a big bear. I I don't know much about how how many pounds you think that bear is. Oh, probably his, seven eight hundred pounds at least. Yeah, his back is as tall as a fifty five gallon barrel. Yeah. Now, I tried to picture <laughs> myself sitting in a tree stand because you've got a little ladder stand that you're sitting on 
beside this bait barrel. I tried to picture what it's like to set there. I think I'd be okay in the daytime. <laughs> but <laughs> access, we talk about access a lot because we talk about big bucks on the Pursuit One Outdoors. Access in and out of our stands is a big deal for you don't want to spook them. Well, access in and out of a bear bait would be incredibly important because you're the one that doesn't want to be spooked. Does that bother you going in there? Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's pretty spooky coming in, going in and coming back out. But, you know, too, I, I've sat in deer stands for years now, and every time a deer comes in, whether it's a doe or a buck, you know, your heart starts racing, and, you know, you think, is this the one I'm going to shoot tonight? But think about how your heart races when that bear, you start seeing a bear coming in to view. Uh, you, you don't have room for mistakes. If, if you're going to shoot it, it's got to be the right shot. So yeah. it's... And, of course, you've had them come in that you didn't want to shoot. Right. And so you don't want them, you definitely don't want them to notice you're there. Right. So you just try to be as stealthy and quiet as you can be. Travis, did you guys, did you go out to that site? We went out to the area where he gets off the truck and takes a side-by-side up the mountain. But his side-by-side was in the shop because it had an oil problem. Okay. Uh, that we just picked it up today, Dad. You were there, but um, it's we saw the area. Yeah, it's it's pretty remote, right? It's very remote, and yeah. and even I normally park my side by side about a quarter to half a mile from the, the bear bait station. But getting back into it, it's pretty dense. A lot of alders and and high weeds and grass. So you got you got to be on your A game going in and out. Hey, do you put it there so you don't, basically, people don't stumble upon it? Right. Yeah, I've noticed up here, there's not real, there's a respect for bears, uh, but there's not a huge fear of bears. Um, well, there probably is in some people, but not like I have. I met a couple of guys from Fairbanks when we were on the Hall Road, um, and I was just walking up the road to, to reunite with you guys. And one of those guys was super excited, not because he had spotted a caribou, but because he had spotted a, uh, he thought, in his estimation, about a 700-pound grizzly on the other side of the river. And he was going to, hoping to have another encounter and take that bear with his bow. <laughs> and I, I said, do you have a gun for backup? And he said, oh, no, no. I just hope to get him with one shot. <laughs> You're nuts. Yeah, that's, 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 that's Alaska. It's wild. It's full of life. Full of life. Well, we went on the haul road uh, in pursuit of caribou. So, Travis, do your best to describe the challenge of, of taking a caribou, finding a caribou, and dealing with the tundra uh, of northern Alaska. Well, it helps if there's caribou there. Of course, but that was our struggle all week. We had a hard time finding them, and it's hard to hunt what's not there. I think Monday, what did we see, 18? 18, yeah. Um, a few decent bulls, put a couple stalks in. Dave, that's not normal, though, is it? In the no, past, I mean, you've gone up there repeatedly. You've oh, seen I mean, everywhere. I mean, just both sides of the road. Uh, not huge herds, but, you know, t- 10, 20 together at a time. And then scattered throughout. And so we saw 18, 19 Travs. And, and again, it's, it's caribou are different, right? They're not like deer. They don't stay in an area. They, they're either Constantly there or the they move. are not. Constantly on the move, migrating, eating, moving. Um, and then we made a couple stocks, went up to Dead Horse for fuel because the road's so long. And between Coldfoot and Dead Horse, what is it, Chief? It's about 240 miles. Those are the only two places you can get gas yep. in the hunting area, so essentially. Plan that. We had spare tires, two spare tires, and we had we had gas with us. Yeah, Tw- twenty gallons of gas. So we go up to Dead Horse and get fuel, and on our way back, we see a bull, and we make another stock. Doesn't pan out, and that we chase those bulls for a little bit. We set up on them, try to get in front of them, but. There's hunters, and when there's not many caribou, 
the hunters are all on the same caribou, so different people are trying to make different plays. It didn't pan out. Well, that one of those moves, it didn't pan out for us in part because we, we encountered water, um, which for us turned out to be a, a reoccurring story. Yeah, there was a lot of water, water everywhere. Creek said normally you could probably walk across where just too full. Couldn't get across them. Well, it had rained out all day Tuesday, so Wednesday when we really had a good opportunity to get on some, uh, because of the heavy rains on Tuesday, we couldn't couldn't reach them, couldn't cross yeah. the creeks. And it was real overcast Tuesday, foggy, so we very low visibility. We had trouble even finding caribou. We made another trip to Dead Horse and had lunch up there and kind of relaxed a little bit because you couldn't see anything. It started to clear up, and we made our way back. We saw one bull by pump station two and it was out on a lake and some guys were already making a stock on it they were going to try to get to that caribou with a long bow yeah trad bows yeah (laughs) you know one thing we didn't explain to them that uh, the whole road was built actually so they could put in the pipeline that runs from prudhoe bay to valdez so and they built that road in how many 55 days Uh, unbelievable yeah so the pipeline runs the whole dalton highway or hall road whatever you want to call it it's actually called both so uh there's a five mile quarter on each each side of the road that you can only use a bow to hunt with right if you want to use a rifle you've got to go outside that five mile quarter so if if we could have shot rifles, we would have limited out. Oh yeah, the first day we were there. Right. But you had to shoot them with a bow or do the five mile hike through tundra. Well, the and three a- of us were together there on a group of four coming up a valley, and you um, you ranged them at what was it three seventy four? Uh, some somewhere around there. Yeah, Travis but- and I put a stock. <laughs> We had this, I, I guess I shouldn't drop Travis into this, had this crazy idea to use my big red cow, Montana <laughs> decoy, that I used on antelope. Worked wonderfully back in the fall. And we're walking out across the tundra, and we were, what was the last range you got on those, Travis? 210, something like that? 228 yards. Yeah. We're doing okay, but when, they, when we popped up behind that big red cow, those caribou went on high alert. And I said to Travis, they think this is a grizzly bear. Yeah. And I just reflecting, I, I realized it, they probably looked more like a grizzly bear. They don't have any connection to a big red cow, but, hey, it was worth a shot. Uh, but we had 200 yards. We could, we'd have been in easy range with a rifle at that point. And there was a nice bull in that group. Travis, you never did uh, explain hiking through the tundra. How difficult that is. Wow. It's hard to explain to someone who's never experienced it. Uh, You read all types of stuff online, articles and forums and stuff about people talking about what it's like to walk through the tundra. And you can't grasp it until you're there. But my best description would be walking through wet sand. And some of it is firm. Some of it you'll sink four inches. Some of it you'll sink eight inches. Some of it you'll step on and think it's going to be firm, and half of it isn't, and you'll roll your ankle. Jeff, and I don't think that's a very good description to you. I think he's making it sound easy. Uh, that sounds too easy to me. <laughs> <laughs> I read a guy who said it's like walking on a waterbed filled with bowling balls. Oh, I think that's closer. <laughs> Nasty stuff. Uh, of course, Travis is in pretty good shape. That, that might explain some of that. I'm not in that great shape. But you run marathons. That's right, hey, and I still think it's hard. Yeah, but you're an old man. Uh, <laughs> Be careful. We, we, to me, the, the challenge, okay, the, there's these tuft. What, what's the word for the, the balls of Tussocks. grass? Tufts. Tufts of grass. Yeah. About the size of a volleyball or a basketball that'll stick up maybe 18 inches out of the mossy bottom. So it's not level at all. And the big debate is, do you walk on top of the tufts or, or between down them. between them? If you walk between them, you got to step up and over. So it's like you're lifting your leg up and around these tufts of grass, and you step on the soft bottoms. And what? We, we gauged you. Every every step sinks some. Yeah. You might sink six inches, though. 
uh, as you step down in and stuff. And but standing on top of them, I tried that. That didn't work for me because they're not evenly spaced. Well, the, a lot of the gaps in between them too are full of water. So, water everywhere. Yeah. Your your best waterproof boots are not going to be waterproof very long. Typically. Yeah, Unless I have really boots. I have really great boots. And it, I mean you water's up over your tops of your boots all the time and even the best boots are going to get wet when it's yeah. over the tops. Yeah. So the the caribou hunting part of it is a lot about a spot and stock. And then of course your stock is across this tundra. No trees. And yeah, that that's exactly what I was going to get to, Travis. We we had a setup off of the pipeline. So you've got this huge pipeline down along the side of the road. It may be close to it. It may be as much as a quarter of a mile off, but pretty much parallels the Dalton Highway. And you're, you're, you spot some caribou and you get your bow and you have to head out to, you know, to try to approach that animal, but there's no way to approach it. There's no, no terrain or nothing to work with. No rocks, no trees. There's hardly even bushes. Hardly any, even There's any There's some brush down along the waterways. But if the caribou's not there, that doesn't do you any good. Yep. We, we observed that they're very uh, jumpy. But now I, I've talked to different people who said that it's not normally the case. Usually they'll let you approach 80, 100 yards without getting too spooked. But these wouldn't. They kind of presume maybe it's because there weren't as many right now. The herd isn't primarily present, and so the ones that are there are getting hunted pretty hard. I don't. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on them. Yeah. Uh, yeah years past, normally you could walk right up to one within about 80 yards, and then it would start moving. And that's about as close as you could ever get is about 80 yards if they see you. Now, if you're able to get in on them and they don't see you, obviously you can get a lot closer. I just think there's been so much pressure on them that they're. My best opportunity came from a, uh, a spot that I made, which is kind of uncommon. I'm not that great. Usually I'm not the first eyes on them, but I happen to see these, uh, this group of uh, first three caribou. They were past the pipeline, but not too far, but they were just in such a location that they were only visible for a moment from the road happened to see him we backed up Travis verified yeah that's caribou we get ourselves ready and send that on a stock those caribou flushed I guess that's a proper word for caribou running yeah <laughs> they spooked spooked uh, from Travis and I that's the cow incident Travis headed back and it joined you you guys went down the road I kind of tried to get in front of them because, again, caribou are always on the booth. I stayed back and tried to just slowly and subtly push these caribou. Now, you you have to try to picture this, but I feel like I'm, I'm carrying... Um, back in high school, when I ran, we used to put leg weights on. And I always wore those leg weights so I could be a better have Stronger. a better vertical jump and all that kind of st- stupid stuff. Well, I felt like I felt like I had leg weights on. Uh-huh. And I'm trying to get through this and these caribou are just kind of dancing across the tundra and and leave me and head towards you guys. Right. What happened when they got to you? Well, we got in front of them and started to get out and we were having trouble. It's rolling hills. It's not mountainous. Surrounded by mountains, but not mountainous, is rolling hills. So we're trying to use the little bit of contour we had to get out in front of them, and they're just so fast, and they just beat us to the spot. So they were already even with us by the time we got, I don't know, we were probably 100 yards from the road, and I just start seeing their heads poke up. And they're already going back to where they were, back towards you, which because was, once they decide they want to go somewhere, it's about impossible to keep them from going there. Not like deer. In the past, you could, I've seen, you know, participated in deer drives. Don't do that anymore, but used to be able to push deer. You can't really push caribou. Uh, Got a mind of their own. So I'm, 
I'm probably a mile behind them when they turn back around. But was it that I far? I happened to see them coming. I happened to see them coming. They had dropped down into a, a hole in the grass that was not, I mean, I'm just sitting basically out there in the tundra. And I see them coming. I get an arrow knocked. I hook on the D-loop on my release. And I'm, I'm thinking, they're coming right, right at me. And one of the one of the bulls actually, I think he was at 60 yards as he came by. He made a circle and kind of curved around me, almost taunting me, and never would stop. I yelled three times, just as loud as I could, and he never even acknowledged me. Which is not surprising at that point. He's pretty spooked, but that was my that was my Your one opportunity, huh? <laughs> my one opportunity <laughs> gone. So we watched them. They, they went by me. We cruised back out to, together to the road. We drive down a couple of miles with the direction they were going and got in front of them. Uh, couldn't, couldn't see them for a long ways, but get in front of them. Travis and I set up the hide. Um, you kind of kind of guess which path they're going to take. And they came towards us again. Now, this is when I was driving a road, right? Keep, yeah. Trying to keep them there. <laughs> trying to hurt. Trying to, we, I don't know if we should tell people all this or not. Well, You're hurting them with a toe to No, no, no. I was just driving the road, make sure oh, okay. that if they crossed the road, I'd see them. <laughs> this is a wild Alaska, all right? <laughs> and uh, the Tundra, Toyota Tundra, kept them on the Tundra in front of us. There you go. They were coming right between us, weren't they, Trev? Right between us. We're 123 yards apart, according to the rangefinder. And they were going to be between us. Is Travis going to tell the story, or is he? Um, I, well, I don't. You do a pretty gonna, good job. I'm not going to ask him to give all the details, but they're a beautiful creature. They've got a white throat. They're kind of dark chocolate. We were in the. Uh, their antlers still have velvet on them. Velvet. Yeah. Beautiful. And I had them looking at me at 60 yards. They happened to see. I was fairly well hidden in a ditch. But they happened to see Travis squatted on the side of the hill. He didn't move or anything, but and I don't think they really knew what he was. But that made him turn and they did a little circle around him. I had him at 60 yards, but it was head on, so there's no shot. Right. If he'd have been broadside when he stopped and saw me, I'd have been able to shoot him. Well, he, he circled you. Uh, you made a wing and a prayer shot, um, but didn't, didn't connect. And off they go. And that's, that really was our best encounter. We, we drove 853 miles for that moment. But let me tell you the scene that sticks in my mind from that was I'm sitting up the hill from my son. Uh, the, the river, the Sac. The Saginaw. The Saginaw River is behind him. There's a mountain up behind that. I see him come to full draw on these caribou. My heart's racing. My palms are sweating. I'm, uh, if you're a dad out there, you know this. I'm more excited that I'm watching him have a chance to get a shot probably than I would have been to take my own shot. That is a scene. I don't have a picture of it, uh, at least on a camera. But that is a scene that is imprinted in my mind. That's why I drove the hall road. You know, those experiences. I, to me, that's the, that's the thing about hunting. I, I, as I've matured as a hunter, I think, hopefully, as a person, that is the thing that I've grown to appreciate about being outdoors. The relationships, the connection, the bonding, the shared experience with someone that you care about. Um, you know, and Dave hosting us has become probably a lifelong friend you know just from this this hunting time um that's what it's about someone well, several people have apologized to us did we spend how much did we spend travis our tags were eight six or 660 yeah and then we had to get a license 650 the so tag eight, is one or the yeah. license is 160 so 810 dollars which is not bad we didn't pay an outfitter uh, probably should have paid you, Dave. <laughs> you did a good job on those mountain houses. Oh, yeah, he's a mountain house monster. He can cook them. Um, but, 
you know, so we had eight hundred eight hundred ten dollars, and a lot of people have asked, "Don't you feel bad about eating your tag?" Well, yeah, I'd be honest with you. Travis would say the same. We'd much rather have gotten a caribou, but you've got to ask yourself, why do I hunt? Is it to kill, or is it to enjoy an experience? To you know, to build a relationship, adventure. That that adventure together. Dave, what's what's the reason that you hunt? You've taken several different animals all over the country. What is it that motivates you to keep going? You know, out there? I, I like being in the outdoors, enjoying God's creation. There, there is so much beauty. This this drive up to the up the hall road to Dead Horse, it's hard on a vehicle. It's I mean it's not cheap, but it's just enjoying the beauty that you you're surrounded by. Uh, there's been plenty of times that I've had an opportunity to kill an animal, and instead I just looked at it, taking pictures of it. Uh, it's just it's just out, being out in God's creation. And, uh, and this is a guy that's taken grizzlies, he's taken black bears, um, whitetail Sitka. Uh, his house got a, he got links in it. That's I think that was your son's. That was son. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, I mean, the experience of being out there. And, Travis, and, where are you at with that? Uh, the last couple of years, I've worked really hard on my mindset when I go into a hunting trip. And because as a young hunter, it's one of those early stages. It's all about the kill. Harvesting the meat, you know, the trophy to show your friends, show your family. But I've worked really hard on enjoying the moments and the sights and the experiences and the memories. And it gets easier and easier and easier every year, every hunt, to really reflect on how important it is to get out and enjoy the beauty of what God's put on this earth for us, his creation. Um, There's so many little things when you get out into the woods or on the tundra that you can't imagine that if you really pay attention, you see the details of all the little things and like how they... Like blueberries, right? Like the yeah. blueberries. We were parched. Parched, stupid, and left our vehicle without water bottles. Thought it'd be a few minutes. Ended up being three hours. Four mile loop. Yeah. And those walking that water mattress with the bowling balls. And we find the valley just full of blueberries, ripe blueberries. So refreshing. Probably ate three or four dozen blueberries. <laughs> At least. Yeah. Jeff, I think you mentioned it too, and, and I'd like to second that. But I, my greatest hunting memories, my greatest hunting experiences have always been with either my son or other relatives or friends. Uh, just being able to fellowship with each other out in the outdoors. Uh, being with you guys this week has been awesome. You know, you, I've always said you got to pick your heart, your hunting partners carefully. You don't just go with anybody, but it's people that you can depend on. If you get into a tough situation, uh, you know they're not going to let you down. They're, they're going to be there with you. So uh, it's just uh, building a bond with each other. It's it's awesome. Dave, you mentioned that five mile corridor. Uh, both sides of this road are archery only, but if you're If you're able, and I mean if you're able to get five miles off the road, you can use a rifle. And you did that with your son. I did. About about eight years ago, uh, we had hunted the Hall Road with bows for two or three days and hadn't been able to close the deal. I mean, we stalked several caribou, but just couldn't close the deal. So we finally decided we were going to do the five-mile hike back. And... uh, We were seeing caribou as we were going back, you know, mile one, mile two. They were starting to thin out the further back we got. But uh, we finally made it back five miles, and there was no caribou to be be seen anywhere. After you'd walked five miles. After we walked five miles. Took you two and a half hours, probably? About two and a half hours. Yeah. But we got up to a peak or a ridge line, and, and man, we're high fiving each other. We were just excited that we had made the hike together or made that five-mile trek back. And uh, 
So we were pretty much resolved to just return back to camp at, you know, without shooting any caribou. But we had saw a ridge line about a mile away. And I told my son, hey, let's, let's go check that ridge line out. And uh, so we did. And sure enough, as soon as we got to the top of the ridge line, here came a herd of caribou at us. So uh, we just laid down and waited for them. And when they got within rifle range, we, we each took one. But man, it was, it was an exciting time for, for both of us. Uh, but the bad part is we had to carry all that meat out. So we deboned both of them. Ended up with about 80, 80 pounds of meat both in each of our packs, mm. plus our gun, plus the capes. And your six miles. And six mile hike back out. <laughs> but uh, man, it was worth it. Although it, it was miserable. It was worth it. And uh, that, to share that with, you, with your son, what, what an awesome experience. So if people are thinking about uh, yeah, caribou hunting or, or coming to Alaska, doing the Hall Road, it, you know, this is a public. Alaska is so public as That's far as hunting public. is concerned. We were able to just pull off the road and camp. And you can hunt just not everywhere, but just about. Yeah, just about everywhere. What a what a experience. I, I tell a lot of people when I'm talking about this, I've been blessed in the last couple of years to go and antelope hunt and follow Travis around elk hunting or, uh, you know, to, to go up Red Stag in New Zealand. Those kind of things, when you share those stories, a lot of, a lot of people are, man, I wish I could do that. Well, you can. You can do this. This, you know, the $810 tag may take some time to save. Uh, I flew up here for about 600 bucks. Uh, you may have a problem on this particular one, uh, finding a place that'll rent you a car to go into that uh, North Country, the, the Hall Road. But I think we saw some. We probably shouldn't mention which car companies, but we saw some <laughs> rental cars <laughs> up there. Um, they've got their big logo printed down the side. Uh, I don't know what will happen when those guys return those cars because they're going to be absolutely caked in mud. Um, but, you know, you can do this hunt. You can enjoy, or if not this hunt, you could go antelope in Wyoming or, or whatever. But just to get out and do it yourself, which is the last thing I'd really like to kind of wrap up. And Travis and I talked about this today uh, as we were thinking about the future and maybe trying to pick out a place to go elk hunting, is that if you really want to get game consistently and quality game, you're probably going to have to pay for it. You're, you know, you're going to have to fly in. We could have we could have gotten on an airplane and flown in. It would have cost us about three grand, I think. Well, uh, he, he was going to give it to us for a half price, fifteen hundred bucks, since we were already there. Since we were already there, but cash, if we booked, yeah, cash. yeah, cash. That's yeah, right. Which I didn't happen to have in my wallet in the Arctic Circle, fifteen hundred bucks. Um, and I was doing this do it yourself because I don't want to spend that extra, right. you know, or can't uh, live. Try to live pretty modestly and be a good steward of things um, which, which is what causes me the trouble the only issue I have with not getting a caribou and spending $810 is I ask myself did I spend that money wisely but then how, what's the value of an experience I mean it's just hard true, to quantify true. and so with $3,000 more the, the experience would have been different well and we talked when we were sitting in dead horse what's the percentage of people have made that trek Less than one thousandth of a yeah, of probably. a percent, probably. Probably. Yeah. You know, there's very few crazies out there like us. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so to spend the extra money, and I have nothing against that. If if you're out there doing that, I've done that, been on those hunts. They're they're special, but it could be just as special to just be there, just to be there on your own, and yeah. and. It, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't describe our hunt as being unsuccessful. I think it was very successful. I we just agree. didn't kill a caribou. Exactly. Well, that wraps up our discussion for the Hall Road. We're uh, moving in on Seward, Alaska. We're going to get up early in the morning and get on a halibut cruise. Hope to catch some some halibut. Some uh, what was the other kind of silver thing? salmon? Catch some rock silver fish. salmon. 
some rockfish. Maybe, hopefully, you'll get some ling cod. Fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dave fed us some um, halibut he caught uh, for supper tonight before we left, and wow, I'm hoping we catch uh, several pounds of halibut to freeze and bring back. Uh, but that wraps up our, our podcast for this time. Thanks for listening to us. Pursue one outdoors. Remember, in whatever you pursue, make sure you're pursuing the one thing that matters the most. Well, hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Man, I'm just eager to get out to Alaska someday and do some bow hunting of some some big game. And so uh, I hope you enjoyed our conversation today. Now, also, if you would, hit that subscribe button, leave us a comment, find us on social media. We're going to be updating our content all fall long. We've got lots of other hunts going on. We've got an elk hunt coming. We have a main moose hunt coming. We have um, some mule deer in Nebraska coming. And so make sure you miss, uh, don't miss any of those hunts. Uh, you can follow us on Pursue One Outdoors.